so I will introduce myself first. Um, I'm uh, Helen Glades, uh, based at the British Geological Survey in the UK. Uh, and I am one of the co-chairs of the in situ data group, uh, which is a subgroup of the data working group of, of GEO. Um, and uh, we will um, have a number of presentations this afternoon that will begin with an introduction to the group and then we will have some use cases to highlight um, the importance of in situ data within the context of GEO. So just a few quick words about meeting protocol. Um, as I've just already mentioned, I'd be grateful if you could change um, your name, uh, your identifier in, in, the, in Zoom to identify your organization and, and your, your full name. Uh, I would be grateful if you could also mute your audio when you're not speaking. Uh, during the question and answer session, um, if you would like to ask a question of our speakers, um, if you raise your hand um, or request the floor to, to, in the chat, um, you will be invited to the floor to answer your question, to ask your question to the speaker. Uh, you may also um, direct your question to either one member of the panels, panels panelists or all of the panelists. Um, you're also welcome to make comments in the chat without requesting the floor. Uh, next slide, please, Florian. So just to say a little bit quickly about the agenda and the session format, um, as I've indicated, we will have an introduction to the in situ subgroup uh, by the other co-chair of this group who was participating in the meeting today, who is Heinrich Dean Anderson. Um, this will be followed by some use case presentations to highlight the role of in situ data. And then we will have a discussion session um, at the end where we will invite those of you participating to actually um, engage in the discussion, to submit questions and to ask questions to our speaker or to contribute more widely to, to the discussion that will be guided um, by myself as the moderator. Um, as part of the discussion in an aim to um, move forward, uh, with the, the objectives of the in situ subgroup. Um, we've laid out a number of objectives for this session. This session is intended to be the first interaction between the in situ data subgroup and the geo community. And the aim is to provide an overview of the key focus areas for this group within the context of geo. We also want to provide some initial observations on the development of the geo in situ data strategy. And we'll hear more about that in a moment from Heinrich. And then we'll also have some selected use cases that illustrate the challenges and benefits of in situ data sharing. As part of the activities today, we want to try and capture feedback from the wider GEO community on the priorities for the in situ data strategy. Next slide, please. So during this session, we've also set up um, a Miro board, which will allow us to provide, it, allow the participants to provide interactive, interactive feedback. Um, if you'd like to visit the board, the, the board is actually linked in the chat already. Um, and also the board will be open until the 30th of June. So don't feel that you need to, to actually um, contribute to the group, to this discussion um, via the Miro board in real time. Um, the Moreau board has a number of questions on it, um, which will also be used for guiding our discussion today. So I'm going to now hand the floor to my colleague, Heinrich Steen Anderson, who is the co-chair of um, the in situ uh, data subgroup of the data working group. Um, there is a, a short bio here for Heinrich. He is um, working as a contract manager at the European Environment Agency, and he's responsible for the cross-cutting coordination of the Copernicus in situ com component. And this is a task delegated to the European Environment Agency by the European Commission. Degree in remote sensing from the University of Copenhagen. And before joining the European Environment Agency, he was working as a manager uh, for several years at the Danish Meteorological Institute. So without further ado, I will hand the floor to, to Heinrich, who will give us an overview of, of the in-situ data sub, subgroup. 
Heinrich, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Helen, and good afternoon to all. Um, yeah, next slide, please. <clears throat> what I'm going to uh, uh, tell you today is really uh, a few words about uh, the GEO Data Working Group. So um, the, the working group is really um, uh, is really focusing on on the um, the uh, on the uh, data, uh, the data that is not coming from satellite from satellites. Uh, we focus on uh, on in situ, in in a way. Uh, but in general, we focus on data data sharing uh, and data management principles, data ethics, and also the in situ part. So we have split it, we have split this work into three subgroups, and the in situ data subgroup is one of them. So the main idea is, of course, at the end. Uh, to uh, to uh, to make more data available and to uh, improve the use of Earth observation data in general. So uh, let's have a look at the in situ data subgroup. Yeah, so we have been quite uh, ambitious, in fact, and we have formulated a, a work uh, program for for the uh, coming year or two. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in the details, of course, you can find it on the TU website. Um, what we are trying to do is really to promote the uh, the uh, fair use of data, open data. We will uh, encourage good data management. We will uh, uh, define and promoting interoperable uh, data management strategies, and uh, we will demonstrate. Uh, and communicate the importance of in situ data. I mean, why are we using these data? What are they? Uh, what, what is really the purpose? How do they impact the final products? We will also try to identify challenges and barriers, and we will propose solutions if possible, and so on and so forth. So we have a long list of uh, of, of of very nice activities, and we are uh, uh, and we will try to see uh, how far we can get. Uh, during the, the 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 coming the coming months. Um, next slide, please. So one thing uh, that is is very clear is that when we talk about uh, in situ data, it's really uh, clearly uh, high on the agenda. Uh, you can maybe remember the uh, Canberra Declaration from 2019, uh, which is really highlighting the importance of in situ data also highlighting that in fact we are looking at some significant gaps uh, all the, the 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 dates that are really essential for the applications we do um, are simply not available uh, for some reason and it's really important to um, to uh, to uh, inform about the barriers and try to inform about the importance of actually uh, finding solutions and closing the gaps so, um, so, so this is this is um, uh, the the whole uh, foundation for the NC two data group is really in a way summarized in 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 this uh, in this declaration from 2019, highlighting the importance of 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 this activity. So one thing is really also um, that um, uh, it is recognized that you needs an NC two data strategy. So next slide, please. So what we try to do in in the um, in the in situ data subgroup, with the support of the other groups, uh, we try to to construct a um, a, a skeleton and a consult consultation process to begin with, because we need to find out what kind of elements do we need to uh, to uh, to uh, construct this strategy. What, what kind of elements should be put in there? What kind of consultation process should be in place to ensure that this strategy is actually based on information from the TU community and to also ensure that this strategy will be, uh, will be uh, uh, meaningful and useful for the TU community. So, so, uh, so this is really step one. Of course, we will try, we will rely on existing uh, existing data, existing reports, uh, and and uh, you can see one of them is is mentioned on the um, on the slide here. So clearly we will do that. Clearly we will also work with um, with uh, uh, key projects, uh, the uh, the uh, the regional geos, uh, other other uh, main actors within the geo community to find out exactly how what what how should this strategy look 
how, sh how should it look and how should it actually be implemented? So you can define a number of interesting questions. For example, what kind of role should GEO play in fact? Should, should GEO try to do coordination at global level? Is it really about putting technological solutions in place to ensure data sharing? What kind of, of role should GEO play? What should be the main objectives? Is it really about uh, um, uh, promoting open data? Or do we need to put other objectives in place? Should we do training? Should we do awareness raising? Things like that. And also, of course, we need to consider how to implement this strategy. Who should be involved and, 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 and how should we do this? So, uh, so of course, uh, uh, when, when we have uh, a skeleton in place, when we have uh, uh, some, some, uh, some meat on the bone, in fact, we will then have a long consultation process with geo government bodies, regional geos, and the geo community at large. So next slide, please. So in fact, what we try to do is also now, we, we, we simply start informing about the work. We, fall, we, we, we do it today in the geo symposium. We will inform the geo program board in September. We will have a, a first, very first version ready for the geo plenary in November. So there will be much more about this in geo, uh, geo and the in situ data strategy in, in the future. And of course, we hope that you will also be able uh, and willing to contribute and interested in contributing to developing this in situ strategy, strategy because without uh, the involvement of the geo community, we will not end up with a good and meaningful in, in situ data strategy. So last slide. Ah, okay. So, but I mean, yes. And of course you're welcome to contact us in case, for example, that you are not part of the GEO data working group, but would like to contribute, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heinrich. And, and I think um, Heinrich's presentation very much emphasizes the, the importance of engaging with the, the wider geo community in as we work, move towards developing the in-situ data strategy and um, this is part of the reason that we we very much encourage you to give us uh, your feedback either via the Miro board or indeed by by contacting the group um, because we are seeking uh, to consult as widely as possible in this process. Um, we will be taking questions at the end of all of the presentations as part of the discussion. So we will now move on to our next speaker uh, who um, um, will speak about um, the, the, the first of our use cases. Um, so Ian Jarvis is the director of the GEO Global Agricultural Monitoring Flagship Initiative, GEOGLAM. He's been stationed within the GEO Secretariat in Geneva in Switzerland since 2017. And previously, Ian was the Director of Agroclimate Geomatics and Earth Observation at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in, in Ottawa. Um, so without uh, more any more delay, I'm going to hand the floor to Ian, who is going to present the first of our use cases with regards to GEOGLAM. So Ian, the floor. Okay, great. Um, you can tell by the smile on my face in the last slide that I'm very happy to be here. And I want to thank you, Helen and, and Heinrich, for uh, asking GeoGlam to contribute to this session. Uh, the GeoGlam in situ activity is very new to us. In fact, we created a working group about three uh, months ago. But really, we've been talking about it and considering doing something in this area for years. So for my presentation, I'm, I'm only going to briefly uh, talk about some of the work we're doing so that I can focus on our community's input into the development of the geo in situ strategy. So if you want more detail on our activities uh, beyond what I'm going to present, we had a parallel session yesterday and the recording should be available um, to view if you're, if you're interested. Next slide, please. So looking at the evolution of GeoGlam, uh, when we started GeoGlam over 10 years ago now, uh, the major constraint to global agricultural monitoring was free and open access to geo data. 
And of course, Copernicus and Landsat and other uh, open data sources are really comparable. Then the next major hurdle became the cost and availability associated with big data analytics, computing horsepower. And since uh, the last several years, proliferation of cloud computing platforms have taken to this issue. The next constraint was uh, access to mature, reproducible analytical tools. And there's been a lot of projects, a lot of work on this in, in uh, the last five to seven years, capitalizing on the open data with computing. Uh, and programs like uh, Send to Every have resulted in open toolboxes available to users. So I would just like to put forward that now, perhaps the last frontier to really opening up Earth observation to our community and beyond is open access to high quality, well managed in situ data for training and validation. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to list four of the actions that we're undertaking right now. I have one slide on the uh, data coordination strategy we're working on. And the other three, as I said, you can look at the uh, presentation from yesterday. First of all, uh, if you're developing a data lifecycle management process, we're also currently identifying and managing what is already available. Uh, we're building on existing activities, existing projects like World Serial and some of the e sheet back shape activities uh, and work by AS, by AS, by AS uh, sorry, on in-situ data collection tools and also looking forward to developing uh, best practices for quality assessments so we can uh, review uh, quality of, of the in-situ data versus our user needs. Next slide. So in terms of the uh, data lifecycle management processes, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, the EAV gaps, which are the essential agricultural variables that we're in parallel working on right now, are really driving our user needs. And these are responsive to our policy drivers, of course. These user needs are being met over time by planning, developing, documenting, usually through projects that support uh, and contribute to GeoGram. As a community, we're also looking at endorsing in situ data sets. Uh, whether or not we want to do this. And if we do do it, how, what would be the process and how would we do it? Um, the three blue arrows are really looking at the infrastructure side, the data management, maintenance, and access. And this is certainly an area where the broader geo community can collaborate on and share uh, capacity, processes, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, of course, all data has to be reviewed over time to make sure it maintains its relevance uh, when it doesn't get purged uh, or refined or continued. And of course, the user needs never uh, end. Uh, the policy drivers are continually changing. So our user needs change and so on. The process continues. Next slide, please. So the next two are my last two slides. And I, these are the messages for the Institute Data Strategy. Uh, number one message is we do need leadership. So thank you very much uh, for your participation in this activity. I think it's uh, well warranted and important. Um, we have many solutions, uh, many activities, even just within our community, but no coordination or integration. And if we talk about the need to integrate across communities for uh, to address the really wicked problems we have that require integration, we're nowhere near that. So we need leadership to move forward. In the geo in situ work plan, uh, it really needs to be action oriented. And uh, I'd like to see more words like uh, facilitate instead of encourage and justify and seek funding instead of seek. I hope out of this strategy, we can get some uh, direction towards hard concrete actions that will move us all forward. And then engaging with the geo initiatives a priori. Here I am. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we really want to be part of this process. And of course, together we all go further. Next slide and last slide. So contributions to the policy side and the policy challenges. Of course, advocate for open sharing. This is a given, it's a geo principle. Um, and I'm sure it's adopted, being adopted within this strategy. Tools and best practices support data sharing from best practices for data agreements, that sort of thing. Also, Something that GEO can do through its work plan is facilitate sharing across science communities. And as we are now approaching uh, a new work plan in the future, <coughs> I think the, the opportunity to 
osmosis perspective is very relevant, very current. Um, so in good timing to do this work and, and to be able to get that in there. And on the technical side, advocate for Geo Knowledge Hub. Uh, I think this group, it, they should be expressing their interest and, and uh, support for the Knowledge Hub because it can really play a significant role in the G data uh, management on the, again, on the infrastructure side. There's a need for interoperability and it'd be good for Geo to speak out areas where it can support. We need things like uh, spatial temporal access catalog standards and best practices and interoperability between systems to be able to really move forward in a good way. And finally, infrastructure, as I already, already mentioned, is a great opportunity for uh, uh, progress, uh, creation of a curation hub, perhaps, that could be uh, built upon the Geo Knowledge Hub. Probably wouldn't take much incremental effort to improve the Knowledge Hub uh, to a point where it could support things like uh, access to documentation, visualization tools, and metadata, and so on. So with that, I'll, I'll rest and I'll look forward to some discussion uh, at the end. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, I think a lot of what you just said very much resonated with me and, and certainly the, the role of the, of the Geo Knowledge Hub is, is already a topic we're discussing in the context of the in situ subgroup. Um, because there is a recognition that there is a key role to play um, in, in the context of, of moving forward with, with an in situ data strategy. Um, I'm going to move forward to our next speaker. Um, who is, um, uh, sorry, I can no longer see my screen. My screen has just frozen. Um, ah, okay, so uh, our next speaker is James Thornton. Um, James uh, joined the, Mo the Mountain Research Initiative in 2020 when he, after completing his uh, PhD in hydrology uh, at the University of Neuchâtel, Switzerland. His doctoral research focused on the interdisciplinary physics-based numerical modeling of hydrological processes in complex alpine terrain and involved a wide range of data sets and computational tools. James is currently responsible for the coordination and implementation of Geo Mountains, a geo initiative seeking to increase the availability and accessibility of a wide range of data pertaining to mountainous regions to benefit human societies and ecosystems globally. And without further ado, um, I'm going to hand the floor to James, who's going to um, talk about how uh, geo mountains can contribute to the in situ uh, data strategy and the, the objectives that we've already been outlining. So, James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction, Helen, and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please, Florian? Um, so essentially, uh, mountains are experiencing some of the most rapid and profound uh, change of any environments on the planet with important consequences for, for human societies and also ecosystems. Um, and to put it simply, um, in situ measurements are really crucial in mountains. There are very many variables which simply cannot be measured uh, anyway other than in situ or at least uh, cannot be measured at scales which are relevant for our applications any other way than in situ and some variables uh, in this category could include stream flow measurements groundwater levels uh, groundwater temp temperatures so how, how the permafrost is evolving um, determining precisely which vegetation species are present um, mapping soil moisture at relevant scales etc and certainly there seems to be a bit of a, an ever-growing gap between the amount of information which we can obtain for variables uh, which are measurable uh, from space or via remote means and those for which uh, we still have to rely on in-situ methods. Um, and so more specifically, um, complex technology also proposes some uh, problems for other technologies. So if we're doing optical remote sensing, for instance, we often have problems of, of shadowing due to the complex topography and perhaps even increased propensity for clouds in mountainous regions. Uh, whilst for climate models, we often can't represent the topography um, at the scale at which it controls the underlying processes. So there's, so there's actually a big mismatch here between the scale of variability in the processes and the extent to which we can represent these processes and interactions in our numerical models, which of course then uh, follow through towards our predictions and, and, and uh, subsequent decisions. Uh, next slide, please, Florian. Um, 
However, um, obtaining um, reliable, informative, long-term um, in situ measurements in mountainous terrain is not at all straightforward. So these environments are generally very remote, difficult to access. Um, here I'm showing a, a photograph from my own experience where um, we had to get some quite heavy equipment up into a headwater catchment and you see that the road has been completely blocked by an avalanche, so uh, completely no way. The conditions are often very inhospitable for both for people but also for infrastructure. We have weather stations taken out by um, avalanches, uh, extreme storms, etc. Um, and for certain measurements, there are also more fundamental challenges. Um, so for instance, for pre precipitation, which is a very fundamental input or variable for many, many applications, we can't measure uh, it very well. Uh, simply, we often have this problem of undercatch, which leads to the measurements being systematically underestimated, uh, especially where we have snowy and windy conditions. Um, and in addition, uh, we have limited uh, spatial representativeness of the measurements. So again, we have this effect of uh, complex topography, which means that the measurements we make at a given point um, are not necessarily very representative of the surrounding areas. And coupled with this, we often have a, a lower density of stations as we increase in elevation and, and so forth. And so our information can often be limited. And so the second photograph here is, uh, I suppose, about the inhospitable conditions. This was a weather station which was originally situated four meters off the ground and we've had sort of four or five meters of snow and everything's basically broken. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, and these are not, not actually the only challenges. At a, at a higher level, I would suggest that um, many in situ measurements in these environments are made not by uh, national um, organizations, hydrological or meteorological uh, services, but actually uh, many are made by the research community. Uh, so this in itself is of course not a bad thing at all, quite on the contrary. Um, but what it does mean is that the, the sort of data landscape is very fragmented and heterogeneous. Um, by that, what I mean is that uh, obtaining systematic information about uh, what is being measured by whom, when, how, et cetera, is, is really lacking. And uh, this is all spread around everywhere. And there may indeed be many data sets which are still residing in, uh, in university basements on hard drives. And therefore, really, this compromises quite a bit the discoverability, accessibility, and usability of such data. Um, so to address this challenge, we've, we, we, we've developed um, an inventory of in situ observational infrastructure in mountainous regions, which is global and intends to um, ingest or provide information on um, sites measuring across a range of different disciplines. So a very interdisciplinary um, database. If you could please go, go to the next slide. And so here I just wanted to give you a, a quick uh, demonstration. So these points in blue are all our, all our stations. And we'll soon be releasing this, uh, hopefully this week or next week, via the Geo Mountains website. We also have a, a new dedicated website. And so there's some options there for, for changing the base map. And we can zoom in and, and additional sites resolve. I wanted to focus really on the region uh, around Geneva, because of course that's where uh, the Geo Secretariat is based. And we can click on an individual, individual site and obtain uh, some fields corresponding to the metadata. So in particular, uh, links to where the data actually uh, resides. So the idea is really can people can find uh, the data more efficiently um, than they could otherwise do. Uh, we also have sort of the contours on there so people can query, um, see whether stations are above a given elevation um, or whatever. And it's really just about playing this brokerage role um, in trying to connect all these resources together and providing some information on what is being measured at what frequency, uh, what instrumentation is being deployed. We can also um, search for places or for mountains, uh, named, named regions. So here going to the, to the highest uh, mountain in, in South America. Um, and likewise, as we'll see in a moment, uh, we can also search by individual uh, research site names if we know the name. So here, yeah, we, we, we've identified uh, the peak here. And we can see if there are some stations nearby, uh, where they are, what they're measuring, whether they belong to uh, other networks, um, any comments uh, which go along with this. Um, so now yeah, we'll demonstrate the functionality that we can search for, for, for a given station by name. Uh, here we're going to one, um, I think in, in, in China perhaps. And um, in this case, um, there's not an actual dedicated website for this site, but um, it is described in a, in a peer reviewed publication. So we have the link to this and uh, then we can find some information about the site in the corresponding publication. Um, so yeah, we think this could be uh, very useful going forward for our, for our 
a community of researchers, but also practitioners and policymakers, those involved in global assessment exercises such as the IPCC. Um, so I just wanted to demonstrate this and I would urge you all to, um, if you do have such sites, to, to contribute them and uh, in time we'll make iterative releases of this database. Uh, so here you can add all the information or importantly correct information uh, which we may have got a bit wrong. And additionally, we also have a, a non-in-situ non inventory, which is supposed to provide a home for other types of data sets, uh, remotely sensed data sets or simulated data sets and other tools and resources. Um, so, so there are links um, available for you to contribute these resources also. If you could go to the next slide, please, Florian. Um, in the longer term, once you've actually filled this uh, inventory in, in a, in a more comprehensive fashion, um, in collaboration, of course, with, with the community contributing their local knowledge, then we can do some, hopefully some very powerful gap analyses to see to what extent for a given variable, um, our measurements are, are representative or sufficient with respect to, to geography, time, elevation, uh, other factors potentially as well. And this is important sort of as we're going towards the advocacy part, as Ian was mentioning, uh, justifying uh, why we need uh, either more stations or we need to share the data sets corresponding to the stations which exist better. Um, and, and so this, is, this can be um, very useful to sort of justify where we need uh, improvements. And then just a couple of points to wrap up. We have the, the idea of promoting some of these areas or regions which are rich in observations, interdisciplinary observations to, to so-called mountain observatories or super sites. And this, is, this concept is described in a recent paper by my colleague uh, Maria Shabignova from the University of Reading. And then we also feel that there's really a lot to be gained by developing more intelligent strategies to combine the complementary benefits of in-situ data, remotely sensed data, and also numerical models uh, to, to sort of get the best of all, all these three um, approaches and technologies. Um, and so this sort of concept is, is described in, in one recent paper. If you can go to the next slide, please, Florian, the final slide. Uh, we have the references here uh, towards the definition of essential mountain climate variables. This, this is sort of one uh, pathway which we see this sort of fusion approach. Um, and then I have another paper from my previous research which sort of demonstrates or exemplifies this where we were uh, calibrating a, a distributed snow model according to in situ data, remotely sensed snow extent. Uh, data sets in order to improve our, our simulations in, in alpine terrain. So uh, thank you very much and I look forward to the remainder of the discussion. Thank you very much, James. Um, I, in the interest of time, um, we will move straight on to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Frank Anor, who is Ghanaian. Uh, he is the C CEO of TAMO and a postdoctoral researcher at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, responsible for hydrometeorological instrumentation, modeling and institutional arrangements for water governance, including in early warning systems for flash floods. Um, Frank has been teaching water systems modeling, uh, river basement, basin management, water governance and institutions at the postgraduate level since he was appointed, appointed as a lecturer and at the, and you'll have to excuse the pronunciation, the Kwame Nyukrama University of Science and Technology in Ghana in 2007. He has over 15 years of work experience in the water sector in Africa, especially in the Volta Basin. Frank has worked in 23 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, where he leads the TAMO initiative. And without further delay, I will I'll, uh, hand the floor to Frank uh, to talk about the Twiga TAMO network of in situ sensors for geoservices in Africa. Frank, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Helen, for the invitation and also uh, to Florine and my colleague, Mark, uh, who is also uh, on the call. Uh, basically, we just want to share a, a few ideas and lessons we have learned uh, working mostly in Africa um, and to see how best we can actually make data available uh, for various uses uh, in the Jewish community. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I, we focus also on the Trigger project, which is a Horizon 2020 project, um, focusing on transforming weather, water, and climate information through institute observations for geoservices in Africa 
And uh, we saw that there's a really a lot of uh, satellite data available, but to complement this with uh, institute data was really a challenge. So we want to see how best to address some of these challenges that we face. Next slide, please. Basically, uh, you can look at this this way, that uh, we need both institute data as well as satellite data, because basically it depends on the scale at which you are working. And they sort of work complementarity. So you sort of, it complements each other. Um, you cannot put sensors everywhere in the world. And of course, um, sometimes the satellite might not be able to give you uh, the details that you require. So if you complement both, then at least you have a very good solution, you know, and this is what we try to uh, showcase uh, in the trigger project. The next slide, please. What is our motivation as Tamil? We realized that over the years, if you look at from 1955, where you see quite a dense, so the reddish um, spots show that we have a dense network. And then if you have very light blue uh, or deep blue, it means that we are now missing stations or uh, stations are silent. So how did we get to such a state where we have almost uh, everywhere in Africa in particular uh, silent stations? Next slide. We realize that there are a lot of uh, projects that are ongoing. And so sometimes there's more money, uh, but sometimes there's also less money you know, to uh, help with instrumentation. And mostly when there's money, the focus has been on infrastructure instead of building strong institutions that would ensure sustainable supply of data that is needed for various services. So it is really important that uh, we see how to complement other projects and build on them instead of we starting different projects in many places. Um, again, we realize that the, the sensors that are used uh, often are not compatible. So we also need to see how we can ensure that when we have data loggers in place already, we can plug other sensors you know, to ensure data continuity or ensure that we can actually keep maintaining stations in a very easy manner. Uh, sometimes there are even spa, uh, spare parts that are not locally available. And for very simple reasons like batteries and stuff, stations just stop working. So we really need to address some of these challenges. We also see that there's a lack of capacity um, to operate and maintain very complex systems. And when we, people are trained to be able to maintain such systems, they find new jobs and then just leave. And when you introduce new technologies, people are not really uh, very keen in taking up the technology. So um, yeah, this is a challenge. And I, uh, I'm happy that Ian also talked about uh, cloud computing resources for data creation, which we really need to take up. The next slide, please. So, uh, well, of course, data sharing, uh, uh, Ian has also talked about that. Um, so I will not go too much about that. But also we need very good quality control procedures in place to be able to uh, ensure that the data that we provide meets certain minimum uh, thresholds in terms of quality. And we need to have very strong connection between government, academia, and private, because not everything can be done by the government and not everything can be done by academ the, the academia. But how do we really strengthen this bond to ensure that at least we can use the knowledge to improve data collection and use uh, in, in the region? Next slide. So uh, what we have done uh, to Trigger and Tamo is to really uh, set up our own stations using low cost technologies. And now we have about 600 of these stations across 23 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and ensure that we have quite a very strong uh, back end in terms of IT infrastructure to make this data available through APIs and through portals uh, for researchers as well as for uh, governments and commercial um, companies to use the data. Next slide. Um, so what we do is that the technology has to fit within a particular social context, you know, so that at least in terms of maintenance, it's easy, but people also understand why we are using these technologies. If we keep doing the same thing we've been doing for over uh, several years, we don't expect that this will change. We need to change our mentality. We need to change the way we do things. And that will help us to be able to then have access to the data that is needed. Next slide, please. So this is just a station. And uh, basically we move from a uh, station with no moving parts on the left-hand side uh, to stations that were, were compact, uh, basically. Um, so with moving parts to no moving parts, and then at least also be able to meet certain thresholds where, for example, in some uh, locations, they might require measurements at 10 meters. We try to do that. 
but of course we try to also see the use for uh, having such stations because they just add to the expenses of uh, running such stations. Next slide. Uh, we also deploy in other sensors uh, within the trigger project, um, local sensors to help us to provide redundancy, but also to find other ways of um, collecting data uh, in a cost-effective way. So for example, we have these geometers, um, which will act as a redundant sensor for rainfall measurements. We have evaporometers. We have neon uh, counters now, which will help with soil moisture and monitoring across Africa. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, for us, I think the way forward is to see how we can improve uh, the IT infrastructure for most of the national institutions that we work with so they can easily provide their data uh, online to portals such as GEOS uh, and to the DTS where we can then also get access to. Uh, we also uh, hope that we can still um, keep on coming up with innovations with uh, local sensors um, so that we'll be able to fill the gaps but also have local capacities uh, with right environments for these people to work uh, so that they can also maintain systems that we don't have situations whereby we put out my system, but uh, after two or three years, they are no longer uh, operational. And for people to really um, contribute towards data, the benefit has to be very clear. So what is really the benefit that they get, you know, in contributing to um, uh, the provision of data and what services can they build on this? you know, to be able to support their operation and maintenance. Um, the next slide, please. So at the end, uh, we have to see how the data is transformed into information and the provision of services so people can really benefit from it. And as we do this, people can see the value to which the data that they are collecting or making available uh, brings. And that could also motivate people to share data and make them available. The next slide. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to discuss some of our views. Thank you so much, Frank. Um, I think that was a very enlightening presentation to um, wrap up our use cases. Um, and I think Frank's presentation highlighted um, the diversity of challenges that are faced um, in different regions um, with regards to in situ data. Um, so we'll move on. Uh, so the next slide, please, Florian. So we'll move on to actually um, to the discussion part of this session. Um, we actually only have uh, 15 minutes uh, for this discussion, but I hope that we can at least begin to unpack some of the issues that have been raised by the excellent presentations from, from our contributors. Uh, I just once again wanted to remind you that we do have the opportunity for interactive feedback, which will be available until the 30th of June. So please do feel free to take some time to, to submit your thoughts with regards to what you've heard today from our different speakers. So um, you're welcome to submit questions to, to our speakers uh, via the chat or to request the floor, or if you wish to raise your hand, um, you can also uh, give a, uh, submit a question to our speakers. Um, I don't see any uh, hands raised at the moment, um, and I don't think we have any questions in the chat at this point in time. So um, I, I'm going to, to maybe kick off the questioning um, to our panelists, um, which is focused around very much around the interactive question, um, the questions we have as part of our interactive feedback. Um, a lot of what I've heard today in the presentations from our contributors has been about the challenges that are, are faced with regards to in situ um, sharing of data. And I think there's been a lot of, of examples of the challenges and the barriers that currently exist. And so the first question that I'd like to give to our panelists today um, is to ask them um, what they believe the role is of the geo community uh, in the development and implementation of, of, of an in situ data strategy. And, and perhaps also at the same time, can you comment on you know, the, the Impl the, the mechanisms that could be used to implement such a strategy to maximize its impact. Um, I don't know who from our panelists would uh, would like to start and maybe give their perspective on that on those questions. Uh, 
I could say a few a very brief words, Helen, in particular on sort of the implementation side or what we should focus on perhaps as a strategy. I think the really, really key thing is sort of demonstrating somehow, um, perhaps to, to funders or, or whoever, um, the benefit of going the whole way from, from installing the instrumentation all the way through to, to sharing the data in, a, in an open way. And, and here, this can be hard to demonstrate sort of uh, beforehand, but there are perhaps techniques we could employ, such as, for instance, um, perhaps working with um, weather forecasting agencies to explore, okay, how much would my forecast in an adjacent region, for instance, a, a city region downstream of, of the mountains, how much would that improve if we actually incorporated uh, data from some of these stations in the mountains? And you could sort of do a leave one out analysis and then you could go to them with a clear case and say, this is you know, how much our forecast would improve and you know, an economic price could be put on this which I imagine in many cases will be small relative to the, to the investment needed to, uh, to fund the, the, the process in the first place. And um, likewise, I think it's really important that we sort of do these gap analyses uh, fairly systematically to identify where we get the most gain for the least resources, where, where are the critical gaps geographically or are there certain variables which are important to measure and we really focus on on those as top priorities. If we've already got enough uh, weather stations in a certain region, we don't need more. Um, so this is, I think, where I, I would suggest we sort of focus our efforts if, if possible. And thank you, James. I think I think that's a, a really important um, point. Um, I don't know whether any of our other panelists would like to comment as well. Um, I also see there's a there's a hand uh, from the participants. So just briefly, if any of our panelists would also like to just follow up and then I'll hand the floor to Marie Francoise. Yeah, maybe um, to add to it. Uh, I think also uh, for us as a Jewish community, I think we could also make some of the tools that we have developed um, much more available to data providers so that at least they can use this to build or develop their services because then they see the direct benefit of contributing their, their data you know, uh, to the community. And uh, we should also probably, uh, as Ian said, try to uh, enhance um, uh, the support that we provide to institutions that provide data. For example, if you have geo hubs um, in some regions or countries, they can sort of provide support in terms of data curation for national institutions that might not have the IT support or the technical support to be able to do that, to also make their data uh, readily available. And of course, at the end, it has to be what benefit do people really get by contributing their data? So once you make that very clear, people will be willing to then share the data. Thank you, Frank. Um, Marie-Francois, would you like to, uh, to uh, ask your question? Yes, it's um, about the strategic objective of GEO. I was wondering because I was uh, working with the French Weather Service before, and you know WMO has uh, this uh, resolution 40, which is foundational uh, for the Met Services. And I was wondering because several uh, communities are working on identifying essential variables, like uh, the essential agriculture variables or biodiversity variables, and I was wondering if it could make sense to identify the minimum set of in situ which are needed for essential variables and uh, try to push uh, to really focus on the sharing of uh, these data um, globally. Is my question clear? Yes, it is. Thank you very much, Marie Francoise. I don't know if. Um, um, maybe Heinrich, um, whether you would like to comment, um, because Heinrich is actually uh, one of the chairs of the um, the writing team for the in situ data strategy. So Heinrich, um, perhaps you have some views on this. Yes, and thanks, uh, Marie uh, Francois, for for mentioning this. I mean, the the first of all, you also mentioned the WMO uh, resolution forty, which is now going to be uh, resolution forty two. And hopefully yeah. it will actually lead to more openly available data. Uh, that is certainly a, a, an activity that, um, that, that in, in my personal opinion, that, that you should try to support. Uh, likewise, as you may know, also uh, WMO is trying to find ways to also financially support observing systems in, 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 
in Africa, for example. So, so, uh, so a lot of very good activities there to support. Uh, your idea about essential uh, variables, I think it's a good idea, in fact, because uh, as also mentioned uh, by, by I, I would say, all, all the, the, the speakers, uh, if you want to make sense, if you want to, to, to be able to justify why uh, a certain data provider should make these data openly available, uh, you, you need to find a, an application. You need to, to link it directly to an application because otherwise these requirements will be floating around uh, and, and, and it will be difficult to justify why these data should be made available. Um, so applications like, like what we have heard now today, these three presentations, excellent applications that, that actually allows us to, to link requirements to real world challenges. And the same is true for essential variables before, because they are some, somehow uh, uh, underpinning these applications. So you can, you can maybe in a way split up the requirements into essential variables and, and thereby also uh, relating uh, uh, these uh, applications and essential variables to in situ data requirements. Thereby you can also make it very clear why it's important for, for, for these data to be openly available. So yes, I said, certainly that could be a way to organize uh, the, uh, the, uh, the requirements and to organize uh, the, uh, the, the gaps and the, uh, the priorities. Thank you. Thank you, Heinrich. Um, Ian, I don't know whether you want to comment. I just wanted to support what was uh, just said in particular. I think the essential variables are uh, a really good way forward overall for integration across uh, the communities. That integration that's so desperately needed to be able to address uh, a very complex issues and priorities. Um, so uh, I'll be talking about this actually in the Nexus uh, session tomorrow, but uh, I think um, it might be a way to uh, move forward identify uh, some key variables, essential variables from the communities that cut across and pick a real tangible problem to, to work on. I think that's the way we learn to move forward is together is to do something concrete together towards a, uh, you know, a reasonable target and make progress that way and, and learn from it. Thanks, Ian. I, I think that's a, a, a really important point. I, I certainly come from my own experience working with, with marine and ocean data in the past. Um, having, having tangible um, problems to work on certainly brings people together um, to try and identify common solutions. Um, I, I don't see any other questions at the moment, so I'm going to I'm going to ask the panel panel um, what is probably um, potentially our last question. But I one of the things that I've heard from the presentations today is that the challenges faced with regards to sharing of in situ data across the different um, regions um, are are in some ways the same, but also there are some quite diverse challenges. Um, so for example, um, um, uh, James was talking about the, the, the heterogeneity of data. Um, and I think this again plays back into what we've just been talking about, about essential variables. But at the same time, we heard from Frank about the need for low tech solutions in order to support data sharing in Africa. And, and I just wanted to ask the panelists if they could think of some, um, if they could perhaps comment on the, the mechanisms for implementation of any in situ strategy that is developed by GEO that can really maximize its impact across all regions. Um, because I, certainly from what I've heard from the presentations, and I think this is what Heinrich was alluding to a moment ago, there are a, quite a diverse range of challenges and barriers to sharing of in situ data that we need to potentially address within the context of an in situ data strategy. So I don't know whether any of the panelists have a view on how can we maximize 
the, the implementation of this strategy. So Heinrich, I see your camera on. Uh, do you, would you like to comment? Well, very quickly. Uh, uh, I, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I would suggest uh, two, two things. I mean, one would be to clearly use um, the, uh, the, uh, the different projects already uh, existing in GEO, like the three projects we've been hear hearing about. I mean, use them as a way, involve them, and use them in a way to, to, to actually implement the strategy through these concrete projects. And, and of course, new projects will come. And, and, and I, say, I see that, that for each of them, if meaningful, of course, I mean, there could be an in situ component in these projects, and they could also uh, 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 find ways to actually implement the objectives of the of the strategy. That's one thing. Another thing is that we need to move this to the uh, regional or maybe even local level. So somehow we need to 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 distribute uh, this uh, this uh, idea of working implementing with the strategy to uh, let's say at least the regional level because that's where. Uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, the act I mean relevant activities will take place and they will know much better about the problems and so on and so forth so so that would be two two elements that I would focus on um, uh, really benefiting from the projects and also benefiting from the work uh, going on at the regional level. Sorry, I was muted. You'd think I'd know after 18 months. So thank you, Heinrich. I, I completely agree with you, the, the view that you've just expressed that um, focusing in on the regional level is, is going to be fundamental to implementation of the strategy. Um, James, I, I see your camera is on. Would you, would you like to comment? Yeah, just very briefly, Helen. Um, given that there are indeed lots of the similar challenges, but also important differences between regions and disciplines, I think a sort of overall strategy would have to sort of find a balance um, and sort of seek to develop some sort of common baseline of, of what is similar enough between the regions uh, and disciplines as a starting point. Uh, for this challenge of going from heterogeneity towards standardization, this is uh, precisely what we propose in, in our paper towards essential mountain climate variables, trying to, to, to overcome this problem a bit, but actually the same uh, need for balance um, when we're talking about essential climate variables in general needs to be uh, met or essential variables indeed more generally because um, we have to again find a balance between a set of variables and the way of measuring them which is sufficiently useful and informative to a wide range of applications but for a given problem you know um, you may not have all the variables you need or measured in the right way if, if you have to meet this sort of standard baseline so I think again there has to be a balance there between the needs of individual projects and this has been proposed as a way forward and this sort of General, uh, general standard uh, for, for, for common or, or, or you know, general applications at the global level. Uh, so I think balance uh, is required at all times, really. Thank you, James. I, I, I think that's, uh, that's actually a, an excellent uh, point. Um, I'm just going to come to Frank just quickly because I see his camera is on. And, and I actually think that some of the, the points that Frank made in his presentation highlighted the need for that regional focus as well as the high level focus. So Frank, I'm just going to briefly hand the floor to you before I wrap up. Thank you, Alan. And I think I'll just re-echo a bit what uh, my colleagues uh, just said that um, for us to really implement uh, the strategy that we'll come up with, we need to show that it works. So we have to have very clear case studies uh, or demonstrations uh, that uh, we can provide tangible benefits to people that provide data. And we can have sustainable ways to sort of keep providing this data. If we can show this, then I think we'll be able to sustain uh, the collection of data uh, you know, for the Jewish community. And uh, with regards to um, standardization, we are doing a lot of data integration and quality control, which is really important. So also the lessons from, uh, for example, Africa could be applied in other regions uh, to ensure that even when we have low tech solutions, they meet certain minimum requirements for them to be um, integrated into various databases. Uh, like in the resolution 40 years, there's a sharing of data, but not just any data. How do we ensure that the data meets those thresholds and can be put, for example, in the GTS? Many people are not doing that at the moment. What is the problem? So we have to still address those fundamental problems. And with these use cases, with the current projects we have in the core, probably we can do something. 
Great, thank you, Frank. I think that's a that's a, an excellent point for us to wrap this session up. I, I think the key message that I've heard from all of our speakers today um, is that the role of GEO in developing an in-situ data strategy has, has a number of levels to it, both from the, the, the wider um, in-situ community right down to local implementation and that we need to understand how we can have it maximize the impact that GEO can have in implementing an in-situ data strategy. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I once again would like to encourage you all to provide feedback on this interesting topic um, via the, the Moreau board, which will remain open uh, until the 30th of June. Um, this is the opportunity for, our, for everyone in the GEO community to, to provide some input to the development of the in-situ data strategy. Um, I just want to uh, lastly thank um, Heinrich, James, Ian and Frank for their, their really uh, thought-provoking contributions during this session. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Florian Francis Hakis, who is um, not only providing secretariat support to the group, but he's also been providing excellent technical support for our session today in the background. So um, thank you to our speakers and thank you to Florian. And also thank you to everybody who's taken the time to participate in this session. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, um, I'll wish you a good day. <laughs>